So um, in the discussion you just did, <clears throat> excuse me, um, was there any points where you got stuck, where you really had a disagreement or any parts where you came together and you found some really good new ways of looking at it? So insights or ideas, what came up for you guys just talking right now? Hal can be the spokesperson this time and then next time someone else. <laughs> Mainly insight, you know, and ideas we got from just listening to other friends. You know, it can really inspire you because, first of all, you see you're not alone. We all have the same problems. <laughs> Let's start with that. <laughs> and we all really want to get rid of our problems. And, you know, from there on how to do it, we have a long way to go. <laughs> I can say... Uh... Hi, um, we talked a lot about, um, yeah, about chocolate, about uh, how to generate um, uh, dedication. Chocolate pronunciation? Oh, no. No, how to, like, uh, to do a lot of dedications and then it, it, it diffuses the ego and it like um, shows the path if you dedicate a lot. And also, um, yeah, and it's still very, very difficult to, to find it in, in the day-to-day -day life and because we're so focused on many other things and, and to, to listen to the teaching and to find the Sangha and to listen to the people here is very helping to find back the, the path. <laughs> Yes, si, sí, senor. Hey. <laughs> I, I just had another point. Uh, I think that uh, in English, renunciation is also uh, described as definite emergence. Is that true? Yeah, that's one translation. It's uh, the intention to emerge or um, the determination to be free but you will see renunciation so commonly that it's, I think it's important to know what it's referring to, even though it's an older translation. But yeah, definite emergence is one for sure. Yeah, do, when you um, translate it into Hebrew, do you use a word that sounds like renunciation or do you use a word that sounds more like becoming free? Uh, it's more like definite emergence. Uh, if I would in Hebrew, it's hechalzut vadait. Hechalzut is emergence, vadait is definite. Oh, good. Yeah. You've skipped some steps. <laughs> That's good. In your translators, they could go straight to the better translation. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, look, it, you are renouncing something, but you're renouncing suffering. <laughs> you know, you're saying no more. Enough. Um, it's it's an important thing to realize where you can basically cultivate like disillusionment and disgust for samsara and samsaric sufferings while having hope and appreciation and an understanding that freedom is possible. So it means that like when you're experiencing happiness, what you say to yourself is how wonderful it is that I was able to practice ethics in the past. How wonderful it is that um, you know beneficial sentient beings exist as conditions. How wonderful it is that things came together for this joy. And you're trying to consciously change your association. So you, you can say, I'm so happy having this chocolate, but you're in the back of your mind, you're thinking, I'm so happy that chocolate is able to give me happiness because of my previous ethics. You know, also, so it's 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 just giving yourself a little bit more of the real story, the whole story, so that you don't give all the credit to the chocolate. And then if it doesn't work, you feel like nothing will work and you go into this devastated pit of despair because none of your ingredients for happiness are working. You no longer give the credit to the ingredients. You see, they're just conditions. It's just also when you are not um, focused on yourself as 
I, I think this is what I uh, took from this discussion. Um, no matter what thought arises in your mind, the way to really connect renunciation is uh, um, putting your mind uh, onto others, thinking if I, have, if I have this enjoyment, may everyone have this enjoyment. Well, there are people who doesn't have this enjoyment. This is what Orit said, that was so helpful. Um, because in the moment that you're so observed, observed in yourself, um, then you're, there, you, you will always think about how to soothe yourself and how to help yourself or how to avoid things to help yourself. And then renunciation is really not possible then. Yeah, yeah, it's like renouncing self-grasping. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. It, it's really um, just clarifying where does the discomfort come from, you know, and this whole time we've believed the whole wrong story. So it's not saying you're not allowed to get over suffering or to cultivate happiness. It's saying you can have more happiness. You can have less suffering. The way to do that is to stop creating the causes. So it really is a conversation of ethics. Um, it's also, of course, a conversation of concentration and wisdom and you know pathways to empathy. But if we don't have a foundational renunciation, it's very hard to build bodhicitta and to cultivate correct view because we don't have like the momentum or the willpower because it's sort of like, it's good enough. You know, we've made our peace with it. Oh, they're suffering. I've made my peace with it. I see it as a lesson. I see it as a journey, you know, and you just kind of like make it okay for yourself, which then limits your ability to go more deeply. You know, so before we met a spiritual path, making peace with difficulty was very useful and good. And it was an important skill. You know, there is death that's poignant. I need to make peace with it. There is aging. There is sickness. There is all of these things. I make my peace with it. You know, things don't happen the way I want them to. There is disappointment. I make my peace with that. That's useful in the beginning. But then we have to go more deeply and say, why does that even happen in the first place? Does it have to? Does there have to be sickness, old age, death, not getting what we want, getting what we don't want, always going up, going down, going up, going down, nothing being stable, things not remaining in a kind of predictable way that we want it them to? Is that inevitable? Because so far we've just assumed it was inevitable, like we had no choice things have to be that way. But in fact, they don't have to be that way. And that can really bring a lot of kind of joy. Like, I don't have to keep going through this. I don't have to keep hitting my head against the wall. How wonderful, you know? So, um, so we'll do just a little meditation and see how it lands. Um, so we're gonna do a little bit of a suffering reflection in order to be motivated to stop creating the causes. Okay, so it's kind of like breaking the spell of thinking samsara is good at all. It's not good at all. We've just had to make peace with it because it's all we've known. So we're trying to break the spell. So get yourself nice straight back and you don't have to agree with everything that I throw out. Just kind of play with it and see how it lands. Stable posture, grounded, secure, relaxed. and revive your bodhicitta motivation. May all of the work that I do to understand and develop, may it all go towards developing my fullest potential for the benefit of all sentient beings.
So may this practice be not just for today, not just for myself, but expand and deepen. And with that motivation, then we shift focus to the breath just for a minute or two to allow surface distractions to settle. Just the breath, direct, gentle, And now shift to analysis. Remind yourself of the first noble truth. The first noble truth that there is suffering. There is the suffering of pain, physically and mentally. There are struggles in our life. And in a way, it's a relief to name that. I'm not awed or strange for having mental distress, confusion, irritability, cravings. I'm not alone in having physical discomfort and obstacles. This body so often uncomfortable, sometimes even in pain, not cooperating the way we want it to. This is the truth of the matter for us, all of us samsaric beings. And we samsaric beings have the shared experience also of the suffering of change, which is that all of our happiness ends. It's temporary. And what we call happiness is usually, maybe even always, relief of a previous suffering. We call eating happiness only because it was preceded by the suffering of hunger. If we weren't hungry, eating would eventually lead to real pain. Sitting in the sunshine is pleasant if it was cold. Moving to the shade is pleasant because we were too warm. And 
And so we have this suffering of change where we have a little bit of happiness and then it finishes and we chase another form of happiness and it finishes and there's kind of a chasing quality or an unsettled, discontented quality to our life. Even on the best day, a bit of dissatisfaction in the corner of our mind, a little bit of worry, mild annoyance, even on the best day. And so reflect on the fact that this discontent is built into our samsaric experience. So far it has been inevitable, but it doesn't have to continue to be. So far, we've experienced the all-pervasive suffering of conditioning. These five aggregates bound and contaminated by karma and disturbing emotions. Like a repetition compulsion. Like autopilot. A relentless pattern of suffering being confused about the causes of suffering, pursuing confused solutions that don't work and cause more suffering. Either in the immediate, the long-term or both, to ourself or to ourself and others. So this first noble truth describes samsara to us. And so with a very clear observation, we want to hold the truth of how very poignant and unsatisfying this situation is. Try and get yourself to stop making peace with it, but to actually consider there might be a way out of it. And so what is the cause of all of our suffering? What is the problem or the fuel for all this pain? And you shift into the exploration of the second noble truth, the truth of origin. that it's karma and disturbing emotions, not the external world itself that gives us suffering. And so to say karma and disturbing emotions give us suffering, those are not things outside of ourselves. It's our own mind.
you can think about your experience of the teaching on the 12 links. There is ignorance that adds a quality to the idea of self that simply isn't the case. There's a projection that creates an illusion of duality, an illusion of separateness. Not recognizing interdependence, thinking incorrectly about the self, we then do karmic actions large and small, positive and negative, but all under the influence of this main ignorance. This plants a seed on our consciousness, a potency, a potential, And this potency and potential has the imprint that makes us continue to see things as seemingly inherently existent and carries with it the potential to give us more suffering. Suffering under the influence of ignorance, we create more negative karma and more suffering. Suffering under the influence of ignorance, we also generate strong afflictions in the immediate, causing us to lash out and harm others, or cling to them with neediness, or be disassociated and disconnected from them, indifferent, which creates more karma, more suffering. Is this pattern inevitable? Is it endless? Is it choiceless? And so you start to consider the third noble truth, the truth of cessation, the finishing of suffering and its causes. And you just explore with your mind, is it possible to stop suffering? Are there people who suffer less than me? Are there ways in which I suffer less than I used to? It boils down to a belief that change is possible. And so you think, despite the fact that humanity has gone from dark ages to renaissance, to dark ages, to renaissance, again and again, even though history seems to repeat itself, even though ourselves as an individual have a lot of the same patterns we had 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, in one sense, it seems like things never change. And allow yourself to acknowledge that. But then with one corner of your mind, explore, 
Have there been moments of time where there's been a breakthrough, where societally something has shifted? Or for yourself as an individual, something has shifted and you don't do the same damaging thing you used to do, or as much, or as often. Is change possible? And you come to the thought that change is possible, but how exactly does it happen? What creates change? Positive, sustainable, stable change. Which brings you to the fourth noble truth, truth of path or true paths, whether it's the Pali tradition's framing of the noble eightfold path, the Mahayana framework of the eight ma of the five paths, starting with the path of accumulation, all informed by bodhicitta. or the actual pathway awarenesses that become antidotes, particularly the path of seeing, realizing the emptiness of inherent existence directly and perceptually, cutting the root of samsara, fundamentally interrupting the negative patterns. Just let yourself remind yourself of true paths. And so bring all of this analysis together and conclude that if I don't like and I don't want the first noble truth, I have to understand the second noble truth and eliminate it. If I like the idea of the third noble truth and want to pursue it, I need to create the cause for the fourth noble truth and develop it. And seeing cause and effect in this way, we develop a strong renunciation, determination to be free, thought of definite emergence. and dedicate 
Janchu sam chorim poshe, Nake panam kegyuchi, Gevan yam pame pai, Gone gondu pawasho, Tony dawarim poshe, Make panam kegyuchi, Gevan yam pame pai, Gone gondu pawasho. May renunciation, bodhicitta, and the wisdom realizing emptiness develop within our own mind. That which has already been developed, may it strengthen and increase. And may all of this go towards the actualization of our fullest potential. Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. Okay. So it's um it's a good framework if you want to do renunciation meditation by yourself to just work yourself through the four noble truths like that. You can also make it simpler and just look at the first two. <laughs> just look at the truth of suffering and the truth of origin. Um, just make sure that it's back of your mind, remember the truth of cessation and the truth of path so that you don't just feel depressed about suffering and how much there is, how pervasive it is, but you also feel uplifted and joyful and enthusiastic about the fact that we can stop doing this to ourselves. So like this. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll see you guys in a little, I don't know, little while to um, see how it's going with renunciation and then we'll move on to bodhicitta and then we'll move on to correct view. But in the meantime, look after each other and connect with each other and have a really, I guess, very accepting and open non-judgmental atmosphere. So it feels easy to share really freely um, and don't feel like you need to know anything to be able to contribute. Sometimes, you know, not knowing you come out with really brilliant insights because, you know, you're able to see it from a fresh perspective. So collaborate and um, I'll see you when I see you. In two weeks time. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.